Hey, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney. I'm retired, and this is not legal advice. Everything I say is simply commenting on the law, and this will be what we're commenting on today. Today we're going to talk about the Melody Ferris trial, and that's because closing arguments are tomorrow. And so I wanted to go over a few things before we got to closing arguments tomorrow, because I think I know pretty much what both sides are going to argue. But before I get there, I want to talk a little bit about trying a case in front of a jury. Now, this would apply both to civil cases as well as to criminal cases. Going into trial, you have to th essentially be prepared for mental mortal combat. It's it's mortal combat with words as instead of, you know, instruments of death. And that kind of work is difficult for most people and it's certainly difficult for lawyers, but somehow they find a way to do it. When you get ready to go to trial, there's a lot of things you have to have in your brain on that day. You have to know the facts of the case cold. You have to know what the evidence is. Not only do you have to know the facts and the evidence, you have to know that you can get all of those facts and all of that evidence in in front of the jury. Because the guy on the other side, his job is to keep you from doing that. So you have to understand what the proper objections are and what improper objections are, and also things like impeachment. Impeachment is where somebody stands up and says at trial, well, the light was red. And then you go in front of them and say, okay, do you remember the deposition that we took of you in this case? Yes, I do. And you remember it was back in July? Yes. And you were under oath, right? Yes. You held your hand up and swore to tell the truth just like you did here today. Yes, that's what I did. And then you walk them through, you know, your lawyer was there. You had a chance to ask anybody who wanted to, anybody you wanted to, any questions. If a question wasn't clear, you know, you absolutely had the right to tell people that it wasn't clear and get it clarified. You understand all of those things. You knew those were the rules. And yet on that date, you said that the light was green. Do you remember that? And if they say, well, no, I didn't say the light was green. Well, then you bring out your deposition and say, well, see right here where it says you said the light was green. What you'll sometimes see, and what we saw in the Sarah Boone trial, was the defense attorney saying, well, didn't you say on such and such? And of course, the prosecution responded with, your honor, objection, that's improper impeachment. And so all of those things, the objections that you have to make and the evidentiary issues that are likely to arise. The evidentiary issues that you have hopefully already addressed in motions are probably already decided, but a lot of times if the other side opens the door, you can bypass some of their objections. So you have to be able to think on your feet. You also have to know what the judge likes and what he dislikes. Now, in the Melody Ferris trial, I think it's fair to say that the judge likes lawyers who can get along, who are willing, in large part, to work together to pare down the case to that which is relevant. Now, you'll notice in on my early videos in this case, I thought a lot of the stuff that the state was bringing in was largely irrelevant. But I suppose most of that now went to motive and there were no objections. Part of the reason there might not have been objections, in fact, there weren't a lot of objections at all in this trial, part of the reason is because the judge had telegraphed his intent that he did not want to see a lot of those. One of the things that is sort of basic trial 101 is you don't stipulate to things unless you have to. You know, if, if the light really was red, you can stipulate to it, but if you have one or two witnesses who believe that it might have been green, well, then you can't stipulate to that. In this case, they had witnesses who a lot of times testified to things that they did not know for sure, that they were testifying on the basis of other people's work. The attorneys in this case have done a remarkable job presenting this case to you in a timely fashion. This case could easily have gone on for another week or two. 
Uh, and each time I announced my anticipated timeline, they worked to parse it down further, maybe based upon y'all's reaction to my proposed timeline. Um, there easily could have been several more days of crime lab testimony, uh, which they agreed to stipulate to the reports, to have one witness testify to things that that witness didn't necessarily test, um, but knew enough about to, to present the information to you. The other thing that you have to know is the community. You have to understand what the community is like. Is it a church-going community? Does it have a lot more, um, shall we say, does it have a lot more churches than bars? You know, if, if there are 14 honky-tonks along Main Street and one dilapidated church on the south side of town, well, maybe appealing to Moors is not a good idea. But if it's a churchy community, a lot of times taking the position of doing what's morally right is a good strategy to apply in trial. And all of those things you have to be aware of the very moment you step up to start doing vor dire, because picking that jury is the most important thing you do in that on that day. And although you have to get the evidence in, you have to get a jury that is apt to see things your way. Every lawyer says we want a fair jury. We want a, fair, a jury that's going to be fair to the other side and to us. That's nonsense. That's not what a, what a trial lawyer wants. He wants a jury who's going to see things his way. But he has to say that to make it give off the appearance of fairness. And so essentially that's what happens when they pick a jury is the actual picking of the jury happens out of the jury's hearing. And so they talk about how juror number 14 was picking her teeth in the middle and they didn't like that because they thought she wasn't, you know, paying attention or whatever. And and they do talk about the jury's actions and inactions during voir dire. So a lot of that stuff goes into just having gone through the process. If you've gone through the process three or four times, generally speaking, you can try a case, even though it will feel like crawling up a a mountain of broken glass in your underwear. Now, in order to succeed at trial for the prosecution, they have to know how best to make the jury angry at the defendant and appeal to the jury's emotion rather than their cold, hard logic. And that's because if you can get a jury angry and emotional, then a lot of times they are less likely to listen to logical analysis. And that can be a real problem for a criminal defendant. On the other hand, for the defense, you have to appeal to logic. You have to point out the inconsistencies in the evidence, and you have to challenge the evidence. But you have to remember that many times the medium becomes the message. So, it's perfectly okay to ask a, a doctor who is testifying at trial, you know, isn't it true that, you know, you charge $1,000 a day to be here as an expert witness? That's a perfectly fair question. What isn't a good idea as a question is, I can't believe you charge $1,000 a day to be here at trial? What if, I mean, is that really what you charge? because you're going to draw an objection because you're being overly emotional. And more importantly, you're going to telegraph to the jury that what that guy says is going to hurt your case. So understated is always going to be better than overstated because many times the medium does become the message and you can't let your anger spill out. Witnesses, even those you disagree with, have to be treated with respect. From the moment you leave the house in the morning, you are essentially on stage. Everything you do, every person you say hello to and smile at and pass along the road getting to trial, particularly if you're one of those drivers who likes to display the uh, numeral number one using your middle finger, well, those are the kinds of people that if they pass a juror on the way to trial have just lost their case. So 
It's important to remember before you even leave the house, if you're a lawyer, that you are on stage right along there with your client and you have to do the right thing. Finally, I would just tell you that jury trials are emotionally draining. The last jury trial I had, which I lost, I came home and I slept for about 14 hours. I went to bed at five o'clock at night and I slept through to seven o'clock the next morning because I was physically and emotionally worn out. It can be a very, very difficult thing to have to do because you are holding someone else's aspirations and dreams in your hands, or worse, if you're a criminal lawyer, you are holding their freedom in your hands, and that's an awesome burden to carry. So what the state did in the Melody Fer Ferris trial was this. They set up a credible motive for murder. She had affairs. She had issues with money. She had an unwillingness to compromise. She had an unredeeming scowl the entire trial. It was, it was awful. You would look over there and she would just be scowling at whoever it is that was on the stand. And in addition to that, there was enough evidence of what I would call a lifetime of ugly behavior that it was very, very difficult to think that this could be a wife and grandmother. But she was. And they had to get her past the, the point of being that wife and grandmother in order to create this picture of her as a cold-blooded killer. Now, they also established a set of circumstances where it is likely that Melody did do the dirty deed. They put on lots of scientific evidence that came close, but not close enough, I think, to being conviction cinching. And they established a credible way that Melody might have gotten the gun that, of course, no one has found. But what the state did not do was put that gun in her hand and prove that the gun killed him. Now, what the defense did, first of all, I think they appropriately cross-examined all of the other witnesses. I think they did a very good job of calling into question whether or not Chad or Scott may have been involved, and I think they gave the jury a credible option in that regard. But the most important thing they did, they did on the last day, and that was get the pathologist to say that the bullet that was found, that apparently was in his rib, or they believe was in his rib, the pathologist said that he wasn't even sure it was inside his body, and there was no way he could say that that actually killed him, because it could very well have been the fire. I think that is probably the reason that Melody Ferris will get acquitted. Now, she might not. She might, the, the jury might have bought in at an early hour on all of this other evidence that she is a mean, nasty person, because I think that's how she was characterized. I certainly don't know that for sure. I mean, I don't know the woman, and, and I wouldn't be commenting on the trial if I did. But that's the situation. And I honestly think that you know, nobody wants a guilty person to go free. And murderers are especially awful people. They're the last person that you think should get some grace from the justice system. But the fact of the matter is, in order to keep you out of jail and me out of jail, when we didn't do something wrong, the system has to be engineered to favor guilty people and convict them only on guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And by using allegations against Scott and by using allegations against uh, several other people like Rusty Barton, they did set up a situation where there is not, well, there are other credible threats. There are other people who might very well have committed these acts. And in view of that, I think it's important to understand that if you give the jury another way to look at this such that they can't say definitively one way or the other that this person was involved or the other person was involved, well, now what you have, of course, is an acquittal. And better for one 
guilty person to go free than for a conviction on less than conclusive evidence of guilt. Now, here's what I think is going to happen. They're going to argue for two hours tomorrow in the morning. They're going to go to lunch. The, they're going to come back, and the uh, prosecution is going to finish up with its rebuttal closing, and then the case is going to be instructed. The, the judge is going to give the jury their instructions, and then the jury is going to go deliberate. I do not expect a quick verdict. But here is the other part of this, and it's something to keep in mind. There is a possibility that a JNOV could occur if he if she is found guilty. Now, a JNOV is a judgment non abstante verdicto. Essentially, it means judgment notwithstanding the verdict. This is where the judge sits essentially as the 13th juror with a veto power. And he can say, no reasonable jury could convict on the basis of this evidence, and as a result, I'm entering a judgment of acquittal. That could happen. I don't think it will happen, but it could happen, and that's one of the procedural things that the defense will ask for if indeed there is a conviction, just like they'll ask for a new trial. But again, by virtue of working collegially with the other side, there weren't a lot of objections. There is not a lot of error that is preserved. And so the appellate issues on this do not look particularly you know, convincing or compelling. Well, that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for being here. If you have the opportunity today, go out of your way. Do something nice for somebody. And then if you have any questions, drop them down below and email me at the address above. And of course, come on back tomorrow. Join me down here at the beach. We'll talk about something else. I shouldn't have to say this, but you don't seek legal advice from a guy down at the beach. You seek it from a lawyer in a lawyer's office where there are people running around in suits and secretaries and all kinds of other people. I'm just a YouTuber. I'm a retired attorney at this point. And although I retain my license to practice in the state of Missouri, I am not here dispensing legal advice. I'm just offering general content on the law. And here are some videos that YouTube thinks you may enjoy.